Good morning. I am Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And I'd like to start off by acknowledging my team, who's always here with me. <clears throat> and we'll be joined later on in the morning by other members of the committee. So today we'll hear from representatives of Health and Hospitals, h and &H, Voluntary Hospitals, Advocates, and other stakeholders about the safety of our city's emergency departments, or EDs. EDs have been described as the safety net of America's healthcare system. Our city's most vulnerable citizens utilize our EDs. High utilizers of EDs tend to be individuals with greater needs for healthcare services, including individuals who are elderly, poor, and or living with chronic conditions. Given recent news coverage of severe overcrowding and other issues affecting EDs, I am concerned about the patients and ED staff in these facilities and want to ensure that patients are being treated in a safe environment. EDs have grown increasingly strained in recent years. This is due to a number of factors, including a reduction in the number of EDs, an aging population, limited access to primary care providers and specialists for those with Medicaid, shortages of hospital nurses and on-call specialist physicians in the ED, reduced inpatient capacity, and an increased willingness of physicians to direct their patients to the ED for faster diagnostics. This has caused multiple issues, including longer wait times, patients being forced to occupy beds in the ED hallway for hours or even days before being admitted, a process known as boarding, and an increased strain on ED physicians, nurses, and staff. On average, patients in New York State spend nearly three hours in the ED before being sent home and wait a little over six hours before being admitted, although wait times can vary greatly from hospital to hospital. For example, Mount Sinai, Kings County, Brookdale, and Jacoby hospitals each have an average wait time of over 12 hours before a patient from the ED is admitted. Elmhurst and New York Presbyterian are not far behind, both with average wait times of between 11 and 12 hours. These statistics highlight the universality of this issue, one that does not impact our public hospital system alone. While patients are waiting for an inpatient bed, they may end up being boarded in the ED hallways. Studies have suggested that hallway care could be a threat to patient safety, with one study concluding that patients initially triaged to the hallway have a higher chance of one, returning to the ED within 30 days, two, readmission to observation, and three, inpatient admission. The American College of Emergency Physicians affirms these findings, stating that the boarding of admitted patients contributes to lower quality of care, decreased patient safety, reduced timeliness of care, and reduced patient satisfaction. The increased strain on EDs has a direct impact on the health and safety of patients and staff alike. More and more physicians are utilizing the phrase moral injury to describe their struggles on the job instead of describing it as burnout. Moral injury, a term developed to describe a condition afflicting some veterans, refers to the emotional, physical, and spiritual harm people feel after perpetrating, failing to prevent, or bearing witness to acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. In short, ED staff oftentimes need to provide care that is not of the quality they would provide under moral ideal situations, under more ideal situations. The toll on ED staff has been devastating. In fact, four in 10 physicians report feelings of burnout and the physician suicide rate is more than double that of the general population. In addition, the rate of nurse suicide is going up as well. Nurses have struggled to achieve safe and effective ratios, and in contrast to the New York State Nurses Association's recommended safe nurse-to-patient ratios, there have been reports that some nurses in New York City treat up to 15 patients at a time. Doctors, nurses, and staff also have physical safety concerns, according to surveys by the American College of Emergency Physicians and the Emergency Nurse Association. Almost half of emergency physicians report being physically assaulted at work, while about 70% of emergency nurses report being hit and kicked while on the job, and 80% of
of emergency physicians say violence in the ED also harms patient care. As a result, EDs and staff have needed to adjust their practice to include new trainings and security measures. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Today, we plan to examine these issues in depth to better understand the state in which our EDs are operating. I look forward to listening to hospitals, providers, and advocates about their experiences and ideas for addressing these very serious issues, and I want to thank you all very much for attending today. And with that, we're going to call up our first panel. I want to recognize Councilmember Diana Ayala, Natalia Sineas, Health and Hospitals, Eric Way, Health and Hospitals, and does that say Shaw Natsui? Shaw. Yeah, okay. And please, please correct me if I mispronounce your name. I know the feeling. So, will anyone providing testimony or answering questions please raise their right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Rivera and members of the Committee of Hospitals. I am Dr. Eric Way, Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals. Oh. Sorry, just make sure the red light is on. That's okay. actually a good thing. Yeah. Sure. I'll start over. Thank Good morning, you. Chairperson Rivera, members of the Committee of Hospitals. I am Dr. Eric Way, Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals. I am joined uh, by Dr. Natalia Sineas, our Chief Nursing Executive at Health and Hospitals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the safety of Health and Hospitals emergency departments. Before I get into some of the strategies and initiatives, that we have and continue to undertake to improve quality, safety, and experience of care we provide in our ERs. I would like to thank the committee for taking an interest in this important topic of ensuring safety of New York City emergency departments. Dr. Katz, our CEO of Health and Hospitals, asked me to take the lead on this testimony because I, one, am an emer emergency department physician and I've worked shifts in all 11 of our EDs. I can attest to the very real struggles and challenges that our providers, nurses, and support staff face day in and day out. They are truly heroes. ED serve not only as the safety net for many things broken in healthcare, but for many things broken in our society. When you can't get a doctor's appointment, you go to the emergency department. When you can't reach your surgeon with a post-operative concern, you go to the ED. When you don't have shelter and it's negative five degrees outside, you go to the ED. When you're hungry, need legal advice, need to find a detoxification center, the list goes on and on. Health and Hospitals has 11 full service emergency departments staffed by experienced, mission driven and caring physicians, nurses and other health professionals. Our EDs are bu busy with over 1 million visits last year. In fact, New York City Health and Hospitals Lincoln was ranked the sixth busiest ED in the country. Health and Hospitals operates five level one trauma centers, seven adult and one child and adolescent comprehensive psychiatric emergency programs, also known as CPEPs. We believe to reduce the burden on our emergency departments, we need to reduce the number of patients going to our EDs, improving patient flow through our EDs and expediting the flow of patients to inpatient and observation beds. In addition to improve the safety of our patients and our staff, we are implementing a culture of safety to ensure we provide the highest quality and safest patient care with the best patient experience. First, a core component of our strategic plan is a shift from the old model of waiting until patients are so sick that they need to go to the emergency department, often requiring admission to the ICU followed by long hospital and rehabilitation courses, to one focus on primary and preventative care. Establishing an ongoing primary care relationship to control that hypertension and diabetes can prevent patients from developing a heart attack or a stroke. We have expanded primary care across the system and implemented NYC care in the Bronx, enrolling over 13,000 patients while providing each one a primary care visit within two weeks. We launched NYC care in Brooklyn and Staten Island last month and are on track to implement across all five boroughs by the end of 2020. 
We understand that no matter how many primary care physicians we hire, patients may still choose to go to the emergency department over primary care. They have learned over time that going to the ED may take a long time, but they can go whenever convenient around their work and home obligations and get everything done, a one-stop shop. Therefore, we invested in creating urgent cares, uh, called express care, where patients with lower acuity complaints can have their immediate medical problems addressed rapidly, while also connecting them with a primary care-like experience with a smooth transition to ongoing primary care. We currently have six express care centers live and plan to open two more this year. Once a patient arrives in our emergency department, we have implemented multiple strategies to improve patient safety and flow. We know that patients come to the emergency department to see a doctor, thus we put a definitive provider in triage in many of our EDs. They see the patient right after the nurse completes triage and starts treatment and testing immediately. Another strategy is direct to bed, such as in Bellevue where no patients wait in the waiting room anymore. Patients are taken back to the treatment areas immediately after triage to be evaluated by the providers. One of the biggest influencers on ED patient flow is hospital patient flow. When all the inpatient beds are occupied in the hospital, then new emissions cannot be transported out of the ED, which creates a traffic jam causing delays for new patients seeking care. We have implemented multiple initiatives to improve hospital patient flow and earlier discharges to match ED emission demand. Finally, one of our strategic pillars is to create a culture of safety. This involves a culture of obsession with where things may go wrong in order to fix them and prevent harm the safety to speak up, the continuous learning and improvement. In this strategic pillar, we implemented the Helping Healers Heal, or H3 initiative. We currently have 18 H3 teams across our system. We have over 1,000 trained peer support champions who have provided over 600 one-on-one -on -one and group debriefs after emotionally and psychologically traumatizing events. This is to ensure that our staff are supported so they can best care for themselves and for our patients. We are also implementing the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, IHI Join Work Framework, which connects staff back to their why in joining healthcare, joining and working in healthcare. We believe that engaged, supported, well, and joyous staff will provide higher quality and safer patient care with better patient experience. Over the past two years, we have made significant strides in improving nurse staffing throughout our system, including our emergency departments. We recently reached a four-year agreement with the New York State Nurses Association to pay fair wages, ensure safe staffing, and improve recruitment and retention of our nurses. Health and Hospitals has also agreed to collaboratively address nurse-to-patient staffing ratios with NISA and will follow an improved staffing model. Other initiatives include implementation of a single electronic medical record, EPIC, across the system so that providers have a full picture of the patient's care without having to unnecessarily duplicate visits and studies. EPIC also helps us with many of the Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals, such as using barcode scanners to ensure we have the correct patients and treatments. We will soon transition to a new electronic incident reporting system to reduce the activation energy required for staff to speak up and tell us where there are opportunities for improvement. Together with our robust quality assurance and performance improvement processes, we continuously learn and improve our system. And finally, thanks to the generous financial support of City Council, other local and state elected officials, and other resources, we have been able to or plan to make significant equipment and physical space upgrades to many of our EDs, including Lincoln, Elmhurst, Bellevue, and Woodhall. In summary, as physicians, we took an oath to first do no harm, and as a system, we share the same value where patient safety is what we uphold as a top priority every day. We have taken many strides towards improving our emergency departments, but the work is never done, and we're up to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. So you have some of the busiest emergency departments in the country, and you are taking steps towards improving some of those spaces, expanding them, renovating them, of course, with uh, money from the administration, the mayor's office, as well as city council funds. In fiscal year 2020, the council and the borough president designated $925,000 to Bellevue for renovation and upgrade of trauma slots in their adult ED. And you mentioned some of the other facilities who are going through some changes in terms of capital upgrades. 
So what is the process for H&H to determine the priority of, of the admin funding capital projects and why, do, why does the council have to fund trauma slots in Bellevue? Is that not a priority? So thank you, uh, council member, for that, that question. Uh, it is absolutely a, a priority. We would like to provide the, uh, the environment so that we can provide the highest quality uh, care to anybody who comes through our doors. Uh, the process for us to prioritize uh, physical space upgrades and the upgrades to equipment is a collaborative process with the administration, uh, with our facilities, with the OMB office. The vast majority of our funding comes from the mayor's office. Uh, those that come from borough presidents as well as uh, council, city council are, are supplementary. Uh, we are very appreciative to all generous support um, to, to improve our physical space. Uh, and once we do have funding approved, we uh, take the necessary steps to make sure that we are making these improvements while not jeopardizing uh, the ability to care for patients and the safety of uh, the way we care for patients. I understand. I just want to, uh, and I'm happy to, to fund healthcare services. I think it's, that's a fundamental human right, is that people have access to quality care no matter which hospital they walk into. I'm just trying to get, uh, I'm trying to establish some sort of understanding of when they choose to fund what you need. And if you need trauma slots, if you need x-ray machines, I think you should be at the top of the list when it comes to what this administrative funds. But I want you to know that um, I certainly want to be helpful and supportive of that, and I know my colleagues are, are cer certainly want to do the same. So let's go to kind of the, you mentioned at the end of your testimony, the safe staffing ratios in your EDs. Is there a set staff ratio? So I'm going to defer to Dr. Sineas. Thank you for the question. So with our new NISNA contract, we partnered with NISNA to ensure that our staffing models would align with the Emergency Nurses Association. And we are confident that the staffing models that we've put in place will ensure patient safety. So we made sure that we optimized our systems to look at how many patients come into our emergency departments every hour. And we will ensure that we have enough nursing staff per hour based on the acuity of our patients to ensure safe staffing. So do you have numbers? I, I recently saw, I believe, the contract that said it was one to eight for non-critical low resource patients and then one to five otherwise. Do those numbers sound correct? And can you describe the progress you made in working with NISNA towards implementing these numbers? Could you even share the ratio that was set forth in the contract? Sure, so the ratios in our contract illustrate guidelines from the emergency severity index. So based on the patient security at triage, which is an algorithm, we will then understand how many nurses are appropriate to care for that patient. Going forward, we have established staffing committees with NISNA so that we are meeting every month, every other month, strictly focused on staffing to ensure that all of our areas are staffed appropriately. So this is a partnership that is new for us in our contract and we're confident that we will meet those ratios and guidelines in our contract. And I think that's great that uh, I think Dr. Katz and all of you have clearly um, said how important it is to work with labor and you know whether it's NISNA or 1199 or DC 37 I just want to know whether you could let us what are the numbers do you have a ratio set forth sure so the guidelines are one to one one to two one to five one to eight one to eight that is our goal for us to get there based on the emergency severity index but it's all based on patient acuity so it's fluid based on what comes through the door. And so we have to be prepared at any given time. And that's just a framework for us to really guide nursing um, care hours. But that changes, again, based on the patient that comes through the door. But that's a guideline, yes, established in our contract. I just want to thank Council Member Eugene for joining us. Is there a sort of triage medicine practice at H&HEDs? Do you utilize the provider in triage system? Yes. Uh, so triage is one of the most important uh, processes and tools that we have uh, in our emergency departments to determine severity of illness, 
assigning that emergency severity index and making sure that urgent patients get care immediately in our most high acuity areas. Uh, we do use providers in triage, as I mentioned in the tes my testimony, um, because we know that patients come to the emergency department not to get their vitals taken, not to go through the triage uh, process, but they want to see a doctor or a nurse practitioner, or physician assistant, and have their care started. Uh, and so we, in multiple of our emergency departments, put a provider or multiple providers up in triage so they see them right away. You get the right test ordered from the beginning and started. You get the pain treated right away. You get the fever tri treated right away. Uh, and so we believe that is um, a best practice that we are working towards getting in all of our emergency departments. So you mentioned right away. What have you done exactly to reduce the ED wait times? So You mentioned express care yes. earlier in your testimony, so if you yes. could talk a little bit about how that's helped relieve some of the strain. Absolutely. Um, so by having an alternative clinic, urgent care, for patients to self-select to, uh, if they do not have um, a serious medical complaint or problem, like a heart attack or a stroke, um, they can self-select to our express cares, which is a little uh, less chaotic than an emergency department, but uh, almost like a clinic visit. Uh, and our plan is to staff these with primary care physicians that can say, not only did I fix your problem today, would you like to follow up in my primary care clinic in two weeks? Uh, and make that transition from showing up unannounced to the emergency department to express care and eventually to, to primary care. Uh, so uh, that's one of many ways that we're trying to offload the lower QD patients uh, from our emergency departments. Other things that we're working on includes addressing social determinants of health. Uh, why are they showing up to, to the ED? Uh, and how do we connect them to uh, our community-based organizations, our, partners in the community to address those, those gaps in their social needs. In King's, um, in King's Hospital, there is no um, express care clinic there yet, correct? correct? Even though it's the busiest? Correct. And that's slated to open soon? This year. When? Uh, I don't have the exact date, um, but that is on our list of prioritized express cares and the way that we map this out was uh, we partnered with FDNY uh, and we did geo mapping of where the 911 calls um, across the city were happening and which ones were showing up to, to H&H &H, uh, facilities. Um, and so there are multiple uh, factors that go into it which include do we have a space that's readily uh, available to be converted to an express care? Is there the need from our heat mapping uh, data analytics uh, for an express care? Uh, and are there other things, that uh, initiatives that are going on? And so Kings County is one of our facilities that implemented provider and triage. Uh, and so that is something that's been very successful there. Have H and H patients ever mentioned being referred to H and H EDs instead of other EDs, and/or being sent to H and H after initially contacting another hospital first? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, I don't know of any of those cases. Um, there is an EMTALA regulation that prevents. Um, uh, hospitals for transferring emergency department to emergency department without doing a medical screening exam, stabilizing any emergency condition before even considering transferring. We do uh, transfer patients from EDs to EDs once stabilized when there is a need for a higher level of care. So for example, a smaller community hospital may not have the neurosurgery resources uh, that a patient might require. Uh, and so then you would look to safely transfer to a receiving uh, quaternary care hospital that has a neurosurgeon uh, on call. And so we both transfer patients inside our system as well as outside, depending on the case, the severity, the availability of these resources. 
Um, and I ask because, you know, we hear from many patients, many consumers, our constituents, anecdotally, and you have such a high volume of patients in your systems, and we are very, very grateful to you because you serve such a diverse population of New Yorkers, and so do our other hospitals who are here today to testify. And so your provider in, in triage system, so it, it has come under pretty intense scrutiny saying that the practices increase hospital profits yet cause doctors to perform rapid medical evaluations that are not thoughtful and can be meaningless. And how do we ensure meaningful tests and not over utilization? Yeah, uh, so we, number one, are very happy to take care of all New Yorkers who come to our door. That is our mission. We treat everybody uh, without exception. Uh, in terms of provider and, and triage, I think another core value of ours is that uh, we treat patients with what they need at the right place at the right time. So we, our providers um, and our system is not incentivized to do more, to make more money. Uh, and so I really appreciate that working as an emergency medicine physician in our system with doing the right thing and practicing what I would consider uh, medicine uh, in its most noble form, uh, not being driven by financial incentives and, and so forth. And so our providers in triage are truly trying to order the correct tests and giving the right treatment, nothing more, nothing less. Thank you. I want to make sure that my colleagues get a chance to answer, uh, to ask some of their questions. So first, I'm going to go to Council Member Eugene. Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Dr. Eric, and uh, member also of the New York FN Hospital Department. Uh, I know that uh, in New York City, uh, and I'm sure, I'm strongly confident that our doctors, our nurses, our medical professionals, they are equipped, they have the knowledge, the skill, and to provide the best quality of healthcare to New Yorkers. And I know that they are doing the best that they can do, they are dedicated to do so. But my first question is, uh, are we equipped in New York City in our hospital to face the different epidemics that uh, uh, we are facing almost every two years, every three years? Now we are talking about coronavirus before it was something else. And I guarantee you after two, three years or four years, there will be something else. Are we equipped? Are we ready to face those, those challenges? And if we are, I would be so happy to hear from you the answer. Thank you so much for, for that very important question. Uh, we share your concern. Uh, a few years ago, it was Ebola. This year, it's a novel coronavirus. We face flu uh, uh, season every year. Um, and I do believe that we are equipped, prepared, and we train on this. Uh, speaking specifically to the novel coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, we have a special pathogens program in New York City Health and Hospitals, which uh, both the UN and the CDC have invited to come out and speak uh, to learn uh, from our program uh, that is continuously working with both the CDC, the World Health Organization, uh, departments of health at the state and the city level, uh, to prepare uh, our facilities. We do disaster drills uh, around um, epidemics, uh, such as the flu. Um, our frontline teams train on a regular basis with the, the protocols of putting on protective uh, equipment, um, bring patients in through the right entrances and, and getting them into the right rooms where the airflow is correct. Uh, we, as a system, have already uh, done tabletops uh, about what if 50 rule out coronavirus patients showed up to all of our EDs at the same time. What will we do as a system and as facilities? What can we pause in terms of elective surgeries, outpatient visits, to bring all those resources together uh, for a sudden surge 
uh, in a special pathogens um, uh, threat. Uh, and so I uh, believe that we practice and we drill and we prepare every day just for situations like this, because we know that in three years, two, three years, there might be another virus or another uh, epidemic. Uh, we know that many hospitals in New York City were closed, so that means we have less space available, and the population in New York City is increasing. Mm -hmm. So could you tell me or tell us how we will handle a situation where we have a lot of people infected and we need bed, we need space in the hospital to receive the treatment? Because the hospital has been closed, the population is increasing, we don't know what's going to come. Mm -hmm. Number one, could you tell us uh, what are we going to do? Do we have the capacity to give the proper service or treatment to the people in case there's a tragedy? It's so, you know, people get infected for whatever the reason. Mm -hmm. And number two, what do you have in place as prevention? Because we have to be preventive also, proactive. We, should, we don't have to wait. We cannot you know, identify what will come with all the detail, but we have to have some measure of prevention, you know, in, in case there's a big tragedy and we will be ready or we will be able to minimize the damage. What would be your answer to that question? Yeah, no, I, I, I share, thank you for that question. I share your concern as well. Do we have a mismatch of healthcare capacity with a growing New York City population. Uh, I believe to, to make this equation work uh, as a healthcare system and as healthcare in general uh, in New York City and across the United States, there needs to be more focus on preventative care, on primary care, uh, not trying to build our way out of building bigger EDs, building bigger hospitals, right? To try to keep up or hardwire something that's already broken. Uh, the idea is, can we improve the health of all New Yorkers so they don't need to be admitted to the hospital as often, uh, that they're not having as many uh, serious debilitating uh, medical events such as a stroke. Um, that is how we are uh, focused in our strategy of improving health of the entire community uh, and not necessarily uh, trying to do more uh, cardiac catheterizations for heart attacks or you know, stroke care. Uh, we still want to treat uh, and be centers of excellence in all of those things, but we believe that right, controlling that blood pressure, controlling that diabetes, controlling that obesity, uh, decades beforehand uh, should be the priority, um, and that will reduce that mismatch between capacity and demand for our hospitals. Yeah, I, I do believe that prevention in, med in medicine is something very, very important. This is the best medicine, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, I know that we are doing screening, we are taking several measures to make sure that people don't get sick. As a matter of fact, I'm a strong you know, advocate for that, as you may know. But my question is, you know, when we have a virus, uh, you know, uh, epidemic, uh, like uh, uh, coronavirus and other, you know, epidemic that we had in the, in the before, it is not about prevention. Mm -hmm. It's come like that, boom, boom, yep. boom, boom, and so quick. So my question is, are we ready to end those type of situation? Prevention, we do prevention, you know. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have a health fair, uh, annual health fair, you know, with many hospital and uh, medical uh, clinic, clinic and also uh, medical professional to provide screening to the people. I do that through, throughout the year. But I'm talking about some situation like coronavirus and other epidemic that we had before. Yes. You know, it's not about uh, screening. It's not about prevention. Yeah. The capacity to limit the damages and the capacity to provide the proper treatment to those people who are going to be affected mm -hmm. and the space yep. to put them because yep. we have to isolate them to limit it also the propagation of the disease. That's what I want to hear from yep. you. 
So uh, thank you for the clarification on that question. Um, I do believe that if we can prevent emissions, preventable emissions beforehand, that would free up space. Uh, this is part of it. We yeah. agree on so that. that would free up Some space. of the time is not even yeah. possible. Free up space for, for yeah. when we have a surge. Each of our hospitals has a disaster plan uh, for these situations, which include potentially opening up additional units that are not uh, open day to day due to hospital census, uh, to bring staff in from different areas of the healthcare system, meaning if we're not running ambulatory care clinics, can we bring those nurses and those doctors to help with the inpatient surge? Uh, we um, have different ways of uh, expanding uh, patient care spaces and emergencies um, all the way up to um, having tractor trailers brought in uh, outside of our emergency department to give additional patient exam uh, spaces. Uh, so these are all things that we have a disaster plan on and we drill on as well. Uh this is my last question because I got to turn it over to the chair. But I keep saying that all the time. After Cindy, on the aftermath of Cindy, I visited, visited it, civil hospital and I was shocked to see what I saw. An emergency room overcrowded with people coughing, you know, sneezing, sick people, senior citizens, everybody together. And he, those uh, room or uh, emergency rooms, they were so overcrowded. The nurses and the, the doctors, they couldn't even pass through. People were so close to each other. Just imagine infection, contaminations. And I don't think that we were ready. I don't think so. As a matter of fact, Coney Island Hospital, they had to transfer all the patients to other hospitals. You know that, what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, the, the picture was not too good. was not too good. And I'm very, very concerned about that. Because when there is a tragedy, you know, like uh, Sandy or other type of tragedy that could affect the health, the, 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 the health system or the or hospital, the system that we have in place, I think we have to do a better job. I'm not convinced that we are ready. Okay. Because tragedy and medicine, epidemic, some of the time that goes so quick. And my, you know, to that, let me add uh, you one thing. Our medical professionals, nurses, doctors, do they receive the proper training that will help them overcome the challenges or do a better job in terms of emergency and epidemic, infection? Do they receive the proper training? Because, of course, they have the training to treat people, to do prevention, but I'm talking about emergency and medicine, infection, epidemic, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I, I believe we, we do. Uh, we have infection preventionists, epidemiologists at each of our hospitals that create protocols for each of these special pathogens, threats. Uh, and I myself, working a Friday overnight in the Coney Island Emergency Department, got pulled in to do a donning and doffing uh, personal protective equipment drill uh, with a nurse playing the patient. Um, and so I know this is happening daily, weekly, monthly in all of our hospitals. Uh, we have ongoing uh, annual assessments and, and trainings for all of our nurses and our, our physicians. Uh, being able to appropriately take airborne droplet contact precautions, knowing how to put on and take off the protective equipment is all uh, very much a part of our training and ongoing uh, reassessment and training for our staff. Thank you very much, Doug. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I had the uh, privilege of visiting Bellevue to talk a little bit about the coronavirus and the preparation and trying to understand all of the training that the staff there is going through. And there is a lot of fear and anxiety. So I, I realize that when people are sick, whether they're coming from a different country, they're visiting, they're undocumented, they want to ensure that they're receiving care, they're walking into your emergency departments. So thank you. And I wanted to just turn it over to my colleague 
And first, let me recognize Council Member Maisel and Ayala. Thank you. Um, wondering, going back to the, uh, the overcrowding conditions at the emergency room departments, I wonder, is there, are, are some hospitals seeing overcrowding more than others? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, somebody once described this to me as no two children are the same, and no two hospitals, and no two emergency departments are the same. So absolutely, it varies across our 11 emergency departments. <coughs> Lots of factors depending on are there nearby hospitals with emergency departments, what is the health demand and need of that community around the hospital. And so we have anywhere from as I mentioned, Lincoln Hospital, which is the sixth busiest ED uh, in the country that sees over 400 patients per day on average, to smaller community hospitals such as North Central Bronx that see about 125 patients per day. Uh, and so all the other nine hospitals um, are a spectrum between there. Well, um, since you mentioned, I was, that wasn't my next question, but since you mentioned Lincoln, um, we've consistently received reports from staff um, that while it is one of the busiest uh, emergency rooms, that they are also really seriously short-staffed. This has been a consistent theme since I've been in office. I know I've spoken to um, the chairwoman about this and she's received similar complaints. Has h, &H addressed those staffing issues? Yes, uh, we absolutely take each of those um, uh, complaints very seriously. Um, I have worked four shifts in the, the Lincoln Emergency Department. I see how busy it is. Um, we uh, have done staffing models based off of historical arrivals and severity to the emergency department. We work very closely with the CEO, uh, CNO, and CMO there to make sure that we are staffing to demand. Uh, and so I am confident with our provider and our nurse staffing models uh, that we've already made a lot of progress uh, and we will continue to partner with them to, to continue to, to make progress um, because it is our busiest emergency department. The South Bronx is one of the most health depressed zip codes um, in the country and, uh, and so we really uh, prioritize um, Lincoln as a place that, that we want to provide safe um, mm -hmm. and quality health care to those most in need. And Lincoln doesn't currently have an express care department, does it? It does. It does? It was our second one. When did it open? It was in 2018. I don't remember the exact date. Has it helped reduce the number of patients that are coming in to triage through the, the um, ER? Yeah. Uh, our preliminary uh, an analysis is showing reduction in ESI 4s and 5s, so those are what you would expect for urgent care, your lowest acuity patients. Uh, and um, we are tracking the time to doctor, the time, the throughput numbers uh, very closely, but the preliminary analysis is promising, uh, both at Elmhurst and at Lincoln, which are our first two. So if I'm a patient at Lincoln and I come in through the emergency room, but I'm really not presenting with um, symptoms that would be considered, you know, an emergency. Would then, would the nurse or whoever's doing the triaging then redirect me to urgent care? Is that how that works now? Uh, not exactly. Um, because of MTALA regulations, once a patient presents and declares themselves in the emergency you department, have you have to do the medical screening exam, stabilize any emergency condition and this needs to be done by a provider. So at that point, if you've already used the provider to do that exam and it's a lower acuity, you might as well finish that visit uh, than to stop there and then transfer a patient to express care. But however we can to educate our communities and our patients and their families that if you have an urgent care uh, complaint uh, that you could self-select to go to express care and so we have signage up um, within our, our uh, outside of the hospital, within our, our main lobby, making the community and our patients aware that express care services are available. Uh, but we would uh, we can't violate the MTALA regulation of once a patient chooses to come to the ED, uh, you need to to really um, follow MTALA. I think. So. 
if a hospital if a hospital has seen consistent overcrowding you know in the last few years at, at some point does that trigger a conversation within the hospital's administration within h and h to find a better approach to dealing with the overcrowding i mean i get it in a, in a hospital like lincoln where you don't have i i, I mean i think the closest hospital is, a, is several miles away mm. um so i can see that happening but metropolitan for instance we have Mount Sinai and Metropolitan in the same community. Mm -hmm. Mount Sinai is busting at the seams. Metropolitan, you know, has capacity. Um, what, you know, what conversation is happening behind the scenes to better address the uh, the overcrowding issue? Yeah. So I don't think this is a periodic um, assessment or conversation. I, th I feel like this is a continuous uh, conversation and each of our emergency department chiefs, the nursing leads, the administrative leads in the emergency departments, this is what they think about all day, every day, is how to do continuous performance improvement to best provide the care for the patients that show up at the door um, as a system through our Office of Population Health, through our Community Care Division. We're talking about how do we transition people once they've come to the ED or come to the hospital back to the community. Can we prevent some of these, what we would call potentially avoidable emergency department visits uh, through better care outside the four walls of the hospital uh, so they don't need to, to come. And so this is something that through NYC care, uh, through expanding primary care, through um, the social determinants of health work, uh, we're trying to turn the faucet down a little bit of the, f the patients coming to the emergency department. Uh, but absolutely, once they're in our emergency department, we're thinking about, is there a better way we could do triage? Is there a better way we could do flow from triage to the provider, to the bed? Do they need to be in a bed, right? If they walked in perfectly fine, uh, can they sit in a chair while they're getting their care and walk out? We don't have to make everybody into a sick person that has to lay in a bed the whole time. Uh, and so constantly thinking about how we can improve each of the steps uh, in that process. And uh, last question, how are you, how, how is H&H &H promoting um, the express care hours? Because I think that, you know, for, for a person that has a chronic, you know, uh, illness, you're in and out of the hospital, you're being exposed to all of this information, you may be speaking to your primary doctor who's also referring you, but most of us don't go to the doctor until we need to go to the doctor. And so how do you communicate that express care is an option for me if I am not within the boundaries of where the information is contained? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, so we work very closely with our community uh, advocacy uh, uh, boards, our CABs. Uh, we work with our community-based organization partners. Uh, we have done small kind of marketing uh, campaigns around express care, but signage uh, in the hospitals, giving patients uh, pamphlets and information about express care when they are seeking other care within our systems. Uh, our website uh, are all places that we list the hours and the, the resources available. Um, but we uh, know that patients uh, are liking express care because patients are lining up for, uh, for the clinic to open. Uh, so they've clearly found value uh, in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I know as we are trying to move patients towards primary care, utilizing our Gotham clinics and really staying out of the emergency room unless it's, unless it's critical. And with that being said, I wanna make sure that we are supporting our local clinics, our Gotham facilities. I know there's one in Coney Island, the Ida G. Israel Clinic, and there have, has been some discussion around making sure those doors stay open. So I just wanna ask that we work very, very hard to make sure that we're supporting our Gotham clinics, and we certainly wanna be an ally in that. And we appreciate that. And with that, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank, thank, thank you, you so for much for what you do. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to call the next panel, Dr. David Rich from Mount Sinai and Lorraine Bryan from Greater New York.
Thank you for your patience. And you can begin. Good, Good morning. And just really quickly, oh, we've been joined by Councilmember Reynoso. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Good morning. Council Member Rivera, members of the uh, City Council Committee on Hospitals, it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Dr. David Rich, R-E-I-C-H, apologize for my own mispronunciation. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of the Mount Sinai Hospital. Just by way of background, I arrived at Mount Sinai in 1984 to begin anesthesiology residency and have remained there throughout my career and remain a practicing cardiac anesthesiologist. I was chairman of anesthesiology for nine years, and most recently, and for the past seven years, I've been the president and chief operating officer of the largest hospital in the Mount Sinai Health System, Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm incredibly proud of the work our team performs every day to serve our patients and to keep our communities healthy. Despite our many successes, however, our hospital and many peer academic medical centers and emergency departments face complex challenges on a daily basis. As many leaders of the City Council know, we have been grappling with these issues for a long time. I'm here today to provide information, but also to advocate for a series of actionable changes to improve emergency department conditions in New York City. These suggestions are for your consideration and comment in the hope that, collaboratively and collectively, we can define better solutions. We all have the same goal, to ensure that our New Yorkers receive the best quality of medical care anywhere. Some challenges are faced by all emergency departments across the five boroughs. The greatest of these is that too often patients arrive at our city's emergency departments who could be better served in non-hospital settings. These include hospital at home programs, multi-specialty outpatient settings, primary care practices, urgent care centers, telemedicine visits, community paramedicine programs, and sobering centers. I hope that we will have more opportunity to explore some of these solutions since we can and we should implement cost-effective reforms that address the underlying causes of emergency department crowding with the attendant consequences of long wait times, patient dissatisfaction, and difficult working conditions that demoralize our dedicated ED staff. The Council's advocacy and support is instrumental if we are to be effective in addressing the root causes of emergency department crowding. Mount Sinai is employing innovative approaches to the most vexing challenges for our emergency department. The entire organization, including support staff, nursing, physicians, and advanced care providers, and senior administration, work tirelessly to provide world-class care for every patient we serve. The Mount Sinai Hospital Emergency Department is ranked third in the nation in national, uh, sorry, pardon me, the Mount Sinai uh, Emergency Department across the whole health system is ranked third in the nation in National Institutes of Health funding and is consequently staffed by some of the most brilliant physicians that innovate and implement groundbreaking advances such as the geriatric emergency room and hospital at home. This is not theoretical ivory tower research, rather this is research that creates real advances for New Yorkers every day and the metrics reflect the quality of the team. Patients who come to the Mount Sinai Hospital Emergency Department with heart attacks, severe heart failure, severe lung conditions, or strokes have among the best survival rates in the nation. One reason for our excellent patient outcomes is the introduction of split flow in 2015. Split flow is a national best practice that gets patients in front of a medical expert sooner. Patients see a triage nurse immediately upon arrival, some patients with lower acuity, acuity problems receive their care in chairs, while those with more severe illness receive the care they need more quickly. At Mount Sinai Hospital today, a walk-in patient is seen by the medical provider in an average of 22 minutes, well below the national average. Our quote, left without being seen, unquote, rate is just 1.8%, lower than the national average of 2%. These are superb quality metrics. Yet we are not complacent and are constantly looking to improve. We commission independent external department reviews every few years, and we also benefit from the regulatory oversight processes of the State Department of Health, the Joint Commission, and CMS. Over the past four years, we've made several critical enhancements to our strategic plan that have helped streamline our ED operations. 
We have expanded our ED staff by more than 130 additional employees across every category of clinical and support staff. 42 of them registered nurses, and I just checked 24 additional positions in 2019 alone. We have also added additional nursing leadership to help provide 24-7 on-site leadership support and a float pool to bring additional nurses to the emergency department during each shift as required. We are also on the cusp of initiating a $48 million renovation and expansion of our emergency department that will dramatically enhance <coughs> operational efficiencies, increase throughput, and improve patient experience and quality. Mount Sinai spent $3 million in 2019 engaging a team of experts to completely redesign our ED with meaningful input from staff, departmental leadership, and the community. This effort culminated in the submission of a Certificate of Need application to the State Department of Health on December 31st of 2019. We are working closely with the Department of Health as they review this exciting project. The plan under review will expand the ED by 8,500 additional square feet, doubling the space devoted to critically ill patients. We are increasing the number of exam spaces by 19 for a total of 72 individual treatment spaces, and the renovated emergency department will be able to serve more than 122,000 patients per year, which aligns with the projected volume of the hospital. This is an ED designed for 21st century needs. Pending the various regulatory approvals, we hope to begin construction in the mo of this multi-year project in the middle of this year. A separate construction plan that is under preparation will relocate and expand our observation unit from 20 to 30 beds. While construction will be transformative over the next several years, Mount Sinai is also using innovative solutions currently to decant our busy ED. To address the needs of patients who do not require hospital admission, we opened an express care facility on the same block as our ED in 2018. This unit accepts all insurance. This winter, we've expanded express care to weekend hours and are seeing approximately 250 to 300 patients per week, depending upon the needs. We have also expanded access and office hours for our community in a wide range of ambulatory hospital initiatives that address the population health needs of our community. For those patients who need admission, we added 16 medical surgical beds this past autumn, and these beds are dedicated to ED patients. In medically appropriate patients and with their consent, we transferred approximately 1,000 admitted patients directly from the Mount Sinai Hospital Emergency Department to available inpatient beds elsewhere in the Mount Sinai Health System in 2019. The majority of these went to the newly renamed Mount Sinai Morningside, previously known as Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Transferred patients arrive in a hospital bed an average of eight hours sooner. Our hospital at home program continues to enroll patients with excellent outcomes, and we implement our surge plan as needed to move patients, to move some patients to hallways on patient units. The additional case managers, social workers, and volunteers serve the complex needs of our population by addressing placement issues, safe discharge planning, and facilitating meaningful discussion about the goals of care. In conclusion, Mount Sinai has made major investments that are already moving the needle for the emergency and urgent care needs of hundreds of thousands of our neighbors. In advance of the complete renovation and expansion of our emergency department, we are constantly innovating using science, clinical expertise, and compassion to better serve our community. I thank the council again for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. My name is Lorraine Ryan. Thank you for welcoming me back. <laughs> I'm a Senior Vice President at the Greater New York Hospital Association. Um, as I think you know, Greater New York uh, represents all the hospitals in New York City, and proudly I may say that, both not-for-profit and public hospitals. We also have hospitals throughout New York State, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about New York City Emergency Department care. My understanding of this care, of care delivery in the ED comes through my clinical training as a nurse, my experience as a hospital administrator in New York City, and my responsibilities as Director of Quality Improvement and Patient Safety at Greater New York. And I appreciated Dr. Way's comments on how seriously we take our obligation uh, for continuous quality improvement and development of a culture of safety across our hospitals. 
We also have a significant focus on infection prevention, which is one of the council person's uh, concerns most timely uh, brought up because of the coronavirus that we're dealing with or potentially could deal, be dealing with. Um, I can proudly say that our members' hospitals believe health care is a human right and providing life-saving emergency care to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status or ability to pay, is part of that core principle. The 53 EDs across the five boroughs of New York City provided over 4 million, 4 million ED visits in 2018. Obviously, EDs are a critical part of New York's world-class healthcare infrastructure. Um, Dr. Rich just mentioned the regulatory compliance that um, hospitals submit to both at the state level um, and the federal level and in some small way at the city level as well. Um, and again, these obligations are taken very seriously. Um, secondary to financial strains, um, we are facing a perilous time in healthcare. Uh, New York City hospitals are open 24-7, 365 days a year, and committed to treating all who walk through their doors. Our hospitals, both public and voluntary, serve, serve huge numbers of Medicaid patients and provide the same quality of care to all. EDs, as you've heard already from the physicians uh, and um, Ms. Sinea, exist and are designed to treat patients with acute, emergent, and often life-threatening medical conditions. Care delivered in EDs is quite different from what might be delivered in non-emergency or primary care settings. Um, you've heard about the triage process to determine who needs immediate treatment, patients who come in after trauma, hemorrhage, suffering from the symptoms of a heart attack, versus those who are dealing with chronic illnesses. <clears throat> patients who present with these less acute conditions are assessed, diagnosed, and typically discharged to their primary care provider, if known, or to a clinic for ongoing management of their conditions. And it is management of these chronic conditions which is essential to getting us to solutions with regard to the ED overcrowding uh, really problem that we face today. Many patients do come to the ED with non-emergent conditions that could be treated more effectively in a primary care setting where they would have ongoing follow-up and continuity of care, which is not necessarily, you're not essentially, you're not able to provide that through an ED visit, if you will. According to the New York State Department of Health, around 70% of hospital-based ED visits are either non-emergent and or could have been treated in a primary care setting. There are many reasons patients come to the ED. They have no insurance coverage or are underinsured. They don't have primary care providers available to them because of their, their work hours, their childcare situation, or just generally their social determinants of health that make everything more problematic. The distance to travel is too great or not affordable or accessible. The lack of awareness of the nature of their medical problems is, is something that we need to deal with in terms of health literacy. However, we've heard some very positive signs and, and efforts today, both at H&H &H and at Mount Sinai, for opening up what you can call an express clinic, an urgent care center, as an alternative to presenting to an emergency department. We've also seen some improvement through the federal state-sponsored DISRUP program, and there's been a 2% reduction in preventally, potentially preventable visits to emergency departments over the last four years. But we still have a problem. Uh, we need to ensure that patients are getting comprehensive, efficient, quality care. Uh, and, to do, and in doing so, we can decrease the stress on emergency departments. We must listen to our patients, understand the factors shaping their decisions, what is bringing them to the ED. We need to make it as easy as possible for them to seek care in the most appropriate setting and direct them to the alternatives that have already been mentioned this morning. With regard to coverage, about 95% of New Yorkers now have health insurance because of the Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, and New York's essential plan. However, the remaining 5%, over 600,000 in New York City alone, tend to disproportionately seek care in the emergency department. We must give these patients the opportunity for good community-based care. Hospitals have invested huge resources into building and maintaining major ambulatory networks with care management and care navigation resources that patients with, without a clear understanding of their chronic illnesses so desperately need. In 2017, New York State Hospitals provided over 8.5 million clinic and ambulatory care services to Medicaid and uninsured patients. As we've already touched on, hospitals are building urgent and express care clinics near or close to EDs, enabling patients to avoid the emergency department. 
There's a federal model that we have, we think has some promise, the federal emergency triage, treat, and transport model, which would actually reimburse emergency services providers in the community for taking a patient to something less than an emergency department, to a behavioral health clinic, to a, cl to a medical clinic, when it is clear that the patient is not in need of emergency services. While policymakers and providers need to help patients get care in the community settings, which we believe is the best long-term strategy to relieve pressure on EDs and reduce wait times, we must also make sure EDs function as well as they can and are ready for actual emergencies. Hospitals, as you've heard from Dr. Rich, um, are seeking to renovate, improve, and expand as necessary their EDs, but this is difficult, especially for hospitals struggling to make ends meet with limited access to capital. There are operational strategies. You've heard about split flow. We need to harness and, and better use the technology available to us through telehealth, which could enable a patient to remain in their home and have their medical condition in the moment assessed and then be directed to the proper level of care. Greater New York um, has the greatest respect for its workforce. You've heard me speak in the past to our, the respect that we hold our nurses, physicians, and administrative staff to. We do believe more staffing is needed. We do not believe it should come in the form of a fixed mandated ratio, as you've heard me say in the past. And as a testament to hospitals who have recently no negotiated contracts with NISNA, all are seeking to hire more registered nurses, increasing their abil ability to deploy nurses where they are needed most, but not in a fixed ratio manner. Scope of practice is also very important to be looking at. We strongly support modifications to the scope of practice rules that are commensurate with professional training and education. One promising area is expanding the use of non-patient specific orders in the ED specifically, enabling nurses to perform tasks without waiting for a physician's order. These are low-risk, non-invasive tests such as an EKG for a patient that presents with appearing to be having a heart attack. As with virtually every healthcare issue, social determinants of health have a major effect on ED utilization. We must invest in the social safety net, pursue policies that promote social justice, combat structural racism, and improve access to critical services. In conclusion, while expanding and improving EDs are critical, we cannot build our way out of this problem. We can't ignore the root causes of ED overcrowding. We need to expand access to care and coverage options. Our hospitals are committed to finding innovative solutions to improve ED care with the ultimate goals of helping people get the care they need when they need it in the most appropriate care setting. That is their mission as nonprofit hospitals and as public institutions and as a body of caregivers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I, I want to ask you. Dr. Rich, I have to thank you because you brought testimony that has numbers and statistics and is more than just buzzwords. So I want to thank you because clearly you being here shows you want to work with the city and of course uh, the city council to make sure that we're all doing the right thing. So thank you for being here. In your testimony, you mention a few things I just want to ask you about. Um, you mentioned some of the underlying causes of emergency department crowding. Uh, you know, the consequences of the long wait times, the patient dissatisfaction, difficulty working conditions that demoralize dedicated ED staff. Yet is the issue the ED capacity or a lack of inpatient beds in some of your facilities? Well, I would add a, a third piece to that, uh, Councilman. Uh, that is the, uh, sorry, Council Member. Uh, the uh, challenge is also that too many people arrive at the EDs who don't need to be there. Uh, we work very hard um, to decant the busy EDs through the various mechanisms I talked about. We added 16 beds this year that were dedicated over the cold and flu season specifically to ED patients. And the transfer program uh, where we take admitted patients in the very busy Mount Sinai Hospital ED and transfer them elsewhere within our health system uh, with patient consent. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a surge plan uh, which we activate where we can take selected patients up to patient floors and they will wait in the hallway upstairs pending the availability of a bed. 
So the downstream effect in terms of what we can do with admitted patients, uh, it, we're addressing to the best of our ability. Uh, but in the first place, uh, some of the crowding uh, occurs because maybe 80, uh, maybe 85% or so of the patients at Mount Sinai Hospital ED this year will never be admitted. They will be treated and released. And so in order to address that, we opened Express Care up the block, and last week there were 254 patients that were seen there. It was a uh, holiday week. Uh, say where's up the block? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's about, what, about uh, 250 feet south of the emergency department entrance, but in the same uh, uh, campus of Mount Sinai Hospital. So it actually is a, uh, we, Express Care is technically a, um, uh, an outpatient uh, uh, facility, which is not uh, the same as um, an urgent care in that we uh, bill the patients uh, in the same fashion we would if they were just coming to a visit for a physician office visit, which is advantageous for our patients for their financial benefit. And so um, in the busiest week, which was two weeks ago, we saw 307 patients. Mm -hmm. And those patients self-select, as Dr. Wei described before, and we've worked out uh, processes where we can educate people uh, through signage in the neighborhood and through um, educating our own physicians that instead of sending the patient to the emergency department that we have express care. Uh, and in addition, we'd like to emphasize that there are possibilities to change the way we uh, uh, we approach emergency department transportation in New York City. Now these are, uh, there are some state and federal issues that are involved, but working with the city council, we believe the advocacy could be extremely helpful, and that relates to uh, taking patients not necessarily to an emergency department, but being able, for example, uh, to take them instead to an outpatient facility or to an express care slash urgent care practice a primary care practice, and let's also focus on really that this is the 21st century and we can do telemedicine, sometimes very effectively, uh, but in order to really get community paramedicine to the next level, we will have to advocate with the state uh, for uh, some scope of practice changes so that we can have uh, paramedics in New York uh, uh, operating at the top of their license. So you said 85% likely won't be admitted. How many would be under observation? Well, the observation unit is a, is a separate uh, process, and we have currently 20 observation beds. So a certain percentage of patients in our emergency department will go there. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I could look it up. But it's a, um, a much a smaller number than will be admitted to the hospital and a much smaller number than those who will be treated and released. Uh, and some of the patients in observation, the majority, um, you know, over 90% will go home in approximately 16 to 24 hours, and approximately 5 per to 10% of those patients will um, uh, continue with their medical illness and will be admitted to a hospital. And so in your testimony, you mentioned that patients who come to the emergency department with heart attacks and severe heart failure, severe lung conditions, or strokes have the best survival rates in the nation, which is great. What about less acuity patients? Well, we uh, believe that the left without being seen uh, showing a very low percentage and that uh, the other uh, metrics of, uh, of time to provider being 22 minutes reflect an overall good nature of care and I would say excellent to superb. There, um, in terms of what's publicly reported and measured, uh, I uh, pick things that are actually uh, publicly reported by CMS uh, because I could point to those statistics with certainty. Uh, but I don't believe we have any concern that people with less severe conditions are not getting the same high level of care. And you mentioned also our left without being seen rate is now just 1.8%, which is lower than the national average. And a lot of these changes and, and these improvements by, by what you've described happened since 2015, more or less, correct? Correct, yes. So what happened what were the numbers like before that implementation? And then now that you have this, uh, I guess this new average, which is better than, than the national average, how is the quality? What do doctors say about the quality of care that they're delivering? Well, uh, this all came about with the implementation of split flow. 
And just to give a minor elaboration, in split flow, a provider uh, sees a patient much more rapidly. There is actually um, a nurse at the triage desk, so you see a nurse at the same time that you're being registered for the emergency department. And because of that, there's an immediate triage process which brings people out of waiting rooms, so our waiting room is very, very empty, which is a good thing, into the back where uh, people are either in an intake area, which is designed for people who are very likely to be treated and released, and to an acute area for those who have more severe illness where it's unclear if they'll be treated and released. And so uh, that creates uh, a situation where people get to doctors and nurses more quickly. I believe that, uh, I don't have an exact statistic on it, that everyone is, you know, feels that that's the national standard and that's the way we should all go. Uh, but I, I don't know if I can answer the question more specifically, uh, Council Member. Well, if you, could, if you could look into it and let us know <clears throat> compared to before the split flow, and then, of course, just the quality of care, I guess, as you speak to the nurses, the doctors, the people yeah. that are in your facilities, you know, things are happening quicker, the, the averages are better, but is it the same quality of care? Uh, I will get back to you. Thank you so much. And then you also mentioned you've added additional nursing leadership to help provide 24-7 on-site leadership and then the float pool to bring additional nurses to the ED during each shift. Mm -hmm. Do you have ratios? Uh, we work in a, a model where we focus on the members of the team and address through our collective bargaining agreements uh, uh, through a pref professional practice committees how we provide the staffing. I will defer to my colleagues at Greater New York to speak about staffing ratios, but I will say that I believe we have an excellent labor management partnership at the hospital, and although people will have different opinions about how things should occur, that we work collaboratively, and I believe that in the spirit of working uh, with everyone trying to operate at the top of their license, uh, that the model that we have is a very safe and effective one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to the um, sort of shared um, governance that's taking place in healthcare today and nursing staffing, almost all of our hospitals have something either called professional practice committee or akin to that with a different title on it. All of our NISNA um, contracted hospitals have increased their incremental staffing, as I mentioned earlier, so nursing leadership can staff to the acuity level of the patients that present, whether they're in the emergency department or in a hospital bed as an inpatient. And it, it enables them to de deploy their staff where they're needed to really assess the environment of care, what's happening where the emergency department being a hotbed of activity is usually one of those areas where either members of the permanent float pool or nurses as part of the incremental staffing pool would be deployed. We hear very positive things from uh, nurses um, at the unit level with regard to the professional practice committee opportunity to weigh in. These are unit level nurses that attend these meetings and raise the concerns that they may have. So nursing leadership and hospital administration is hearing directly from those who are providing care at the point um, at the bedside. So I understand you're, you're doing your best to make sure that there are multiple stakeholders holders at the table, and then you're asking on a, uh, of people's experiences, but I'm sorry if I miss the number, or has the, has the State Department of Health approached you about these safe staffing numbers? Do you, do you have an actual set staff ratio for providers and nurses? Two points to make on that issue. Um, in our state code now, and it's been there for a while, uh, part 405 requires nursing leadership to staff to the appropriate numbers and type of staff necessary to ensure safe, high-quality patient care. They abide by that. They are surveyed on that um, as determined uh, by their surveyors, whether or not they're in compliance, and that can be raised in a statement of deficiency. A year and a half ago, the governor discharged the responsibility for the State Department of Health to do a study on staffing enhancements. It did not just purely look at ratios, and it did not just purely looking at nursing care. The state has, um, is working with a, a research university to understand what the supply and the demand would look like 
um, in the future of the population's projection and the use of inpatient services. And what we see is the decrease in inpatient services between now and 2030 and 2040, and an increase in outpatient services. So to get involved in a ratio law that would force hospitals to pull nurses into the, into the inpatient setting and take them out of settings of care where they might be most needed in the future is a concern. And today, we see some very high level services, especially with the oncology uh, community of patients being provided in an outpatient setting or in their homes to protect these patients from um, who are immunosuppressed from being exposed to pathogens in a hospital ED, in a hospital outpatient clinic, or in an inpatient bed. So we would be sort of take going in reverse in terms of where medicine is going if we deployed all of our nursing resources in the inpatient setting. We await the state study, um, which should be coming any day now. And have they approached you? Have they? They've clearly oh, we talked speak, to you, and oh, yeah. they've we, asked for your opinion. The Department of Health held hearings last September, mm -hmm. um, and Greater New York, among all, as well as all of the advocates, um, individuals from the Center for Health Workforce Studies, who studies the supply and demand in New York State said that they cannot attest to the ability of hospitals to meet those staffing ratios with the current graduation rates we see uh, from nursing colleges and other programs if the staffing ratios were to become law. So yes, they very much dialogue with us around this issue. And I realize that every hospital is different. I think they were compared to children earlier, which was cute. <laughs> um, but I, I just, you know, I still, it's very difficult getting numbers from you, I have to say. Um, just trying to figure out how we can set a standard for New York City. Our hospitals are, are crowded. And I, I have to ask you, Dr. Rich, specifically about your emergency department uh, conditions and a story that was in the New York Post in December 2019. Mm -hmm. So they broke a story about my, Mount Sinai's war zone of an ED, quoting former and current staff who say that the environment is extremely dangerous for patients and staff. And over three years ago, the hospital had three out-of-state medical experts come review their ED and their subsequent report detailed conditions that were among the worst they had ever seen. The report detailed poor staffing ratios, infection control and safety, as well as patient boarding and other conditions and as a result of the article, the, the New York State Department of Health announced an investigation into Mount Sinai Hospital, and Mount Sinai issued a statement noting the improvements made to their ED since the release of the, port, the report, as well as their commitment to the safety of their patients. What is the status of the Department of Health's investigation? Well, uh, Council Member, I am very pleased to report that the State Department of Health arrived uh, two days after the New York Post article was published and spent four business days at Mount Sinai Hospital and left and issued a report that found nothing, no findings, and Mount Sinai was completely cleared of the allegations that were raised in the article. And so I'd like to go on record as saying that I'm extremely pleased that the staff of Mount Sinai Hospital again demonstrated to the Department of Health acting on behalf of CMS in a full Title 18 survey that we care passionately about patients in our community and that uh, we are looking forward to further improving the state of that emergency department, which of course does have crowding, and that the uh, uh, certificate of need that we've submitted and the uh, construction that will result from it should make for a dramatically improved patient experience. Uh, there are many claims in that article that we categorically deny and uh, I think that that's probably a, a fair statement of my response to the Post article. So how do you respond to current staff allegations that these issues persist today? And what have you done to improve the situation there since that report? I think that some of the uh, issues I, I specifically put into the testimony address that, but I'll, I'll reiterate them for the committee and that is that the addition of the 16 surgical beds, medical surgical beds upstairs uh, that are caring for our patients from the emergency department uh, in this cold and flu season have dramatically decreased the number of boarding patients in the ED this season, which has been uh, a, a tremendous help. I would also add that we have continued to expand the transfer program 
And note that uh, a patient that's transferred, an admitted patient that's transferred from the Mount Sinai Hospital Emergency Department mm -hmm. to one of our other health system hospitals, the vast majority to Mount Sinai Morningside, arrive in a hospital bed eight hours sooner than a patient on average who was waiting for a bed uh, at uh, the Mount Sinai Hospital, despite all of the efforts and the extra 16 beds, it still is a great benefit to us. And then, of course, we have a hospital at home program, uh, which is a, uh, a grant funded program uh, where we actually send uh, staff into the patient's home and provide hospital level care in the home. And the outcomes from that program in terms of, uh, of curing disease and survival uh, have, been, uh, have been remarkable. And then further, we have a team in the emergency department beyond nurses and doctors that include case management workers and uh, social workers and volunteers and even a, a part-time uh, person from the palliative care uh, medicine department such that we are looking to address the social and societal needs of our patients and work very hard with them. So I believe that there'll always be staff in a place as large and complex as Mount Sinai that are dissatisfied with what administration is doing, but I would like to go on record as saying that I believe that we have made uh, more than a good faith effort. I believe that the institution is fully committed. We love our nursing staff, we love our support staff, and we want everyone to have a, a healthy and, and supportive work environment. And to that end, we continue to just work together. I make rounds in the emergency department at least twice a month, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. with those nurses, and I hear exactly what they have to say, and I try to address their concerns. Some of the, the allegations, the current staff allegations, is that the ratio can be as high as 15 to 1. Can you speak to that? I believe that those numbers are incorrect. We work very hard to keep the ratio under one to 10, but the problem with any emergency department, as Dr. Wei can uh, attest uh, behind me, uh, is that you never know what's going to happen in the next hour. You could have uh, a dramatic influx of patients from ambulances or walk-ins, and so we try to remain flexible and bring down additional staff. We have staff scheduled to come in uh, every few hours as the day sort of ramps up between the morning and the afternoon and with the float pool and with the um, uh, addition of, uh, of, frankly, a physician's assistant to manage the patients who are boarding in the emergency department and floating staff down from the floors, I believe we're addressing it to the best our, of our ability at this time. So do you think that the nurses and staff are overburdened? And do you have any programs or benefits in place to improve the staff mental health in, in the emergency department? Well, we worked very hard to listen and to respond. Uh, we, for example, more than doubled the number of security officers approximately a year and a half, two years ago, and uh, engaged uh, NYPD off-duty officers uh, to be at the entrance to our emergency department to improve the staff perception of, of their own safety. And we still work on that every day because of the increase of workplace violence in the nation as a whole, uh, but that is one area where we've worked very specifically to help uh, the staff. We um, uh, have an employee assistance program. We have a STAR simulation center. I'm not exactly sure what the four letters stand for in STAR, but it's basically a simulation center where we work with our uh, nurses and physicians to simulate critical scenarios. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, I believe that having one of the leading academic um, uh, departments, emergency departments in the nation, is something that brings uh, the staff a feeling of, uh, of great satisfaction in that they work with people who are at the cutting edge. But there's always more that we can do, of course. Can I just add that there are several other hospitals throughout the city that have added security personnel um, to their emergency departments, and indeed those security personnel do accompany the hospital security on rounds throughout the hospital to ensure the safety of patients and the staff. And it, it is very critical that staff feel comfortable and secure in their work environment. I think the other issue that we, we tackle each and every day more and more is recognizing the level of burnout, recognizing the level of stress among healthcare providers in general. This is not 
a problem unique to New York, but I think like everything else, it always seems more acute in New York because of the volumes of patients and staff that, that we are working with and dealing with. So it does not go unnoticed by any means. And you know, as a hospital association, we can only do so much, but we do bring our hospitals together almost monthly to deal with these issues, to share best practices, to understand what's working in your institution at Mount Sinai. Could that work in another institution dealing with a similar type of population and a similar type of volume? So um, we are, we're not immune to understanding and recognizing that it's a difficult environment for healthcare providers, uh, but it's also one that offers a lot of rewards, and unfortunately, we don't get to talk a lot about that or hear a lot about that because it's just accepted as, as the norm. Uh, but we very much take these issues seriously, and as a nurse myself, I understand what these nurses go through. As a re patient recently in the hospital, I asked the nurse how many patients she was taking care of and, and what the work flow was like and what the burden um, of a 12-hour shift is like on a family, uh, a young family. But um, they do it. They see, for the most part, I say what they do it they, gladly and with a mission-driven uh, attitude. Um, but we need to do more as those who are there to protect the workforce. And some residents can spend over 100 hours in the ED in a given week. That's, that's, that's what we hear are some of the... Yeah the work that they are putting in. So that, that mental health piece, why I'm asking about it for you to kind of highlight what you're doing is because yeah. we do know the nurses and the doctors are, are incredibly dedicated and they're motivated to, to do the best thing for their patients. So we want to make sure that we're highlighting some of that work. I, I do want to just ask you, Dr. Rich, about the, the oversight of ED staff. And as a result of the case that we saw, it was highlighted in an extensive investigative report issued by the news outlet The Cut detailing a sexual assault of Asian Newman perpetuated by one of Mount Sinai's staff. And so how has the oversight of ED staff changed as a result of the case? Uh, I'd like to say that the um case of the Aja Newman assault um, that was featured in New York Magazine uh, is, uh, is something that uh, was very upsetting for Mount Sinai. The situation was horrific and abhorrent and in no way reflective of what happens at Mount Sinai. Uh, Mr. Newman is a sick and depraved individual and we are so sorry that Ms. Newman was the victim of the horrible criminal, uh, criminal act that she experienced. No one should have to ever experience what she did, and this is a legal matter, and I'm not aware of and cannot discuss the specifics. Uh, but as soon as the incident was brought to light, David Newman was immediately suspended. We launched a comprehensive internal investigation and worked closely with the district attorney's office to bring David Newman to justice. He has been sentenced to jail for good reason. Uh, we're a world-class institution with top doctors from around the globe, and we hold our entire community to Mount Sinai's high core values of treating each patient with the utmost dignity and respect, with zero tolerance for any inappropriate or illegal behavior towards anyone, especially women. Uh, but as with any medical system anywhere, especially one of our size, 40,000 employees, the size of a small city, and as one of the largest employers in New York, there may be extremely rare isolated cases like this one where individuals do not hold themselves to Mount Sinai's high core values, basic medical ethics or the law, which is why we have the industry's leading safeguards and systems in place to immediately address any kind of inappropriate actions by any of our staff or doctors. And so the staffing at Mount Sinai Hospital at the time of this particular incident was actually really quite good. So I just want to put everyone's mind to rest that staffing was not the cause. David Newman was a sick and depraved individual who deserved to go to jail, and he did. So how has your oversight of the staff changed? The oversight is something which is constantly under review. Uh, we recruited a, uh, a new leader for the emergency uh, department who began his tenure uh, February 1st. I have a bi-weekly meeting with emergency department leadership, and that includes, by the way, not just the physician leadership, nursing leadership, the advanced practice providers, specifically the chief physician's assistant, the chief residents, and uh, in addition, the head of the, um, uh, uh, we call it the, the um, designated institutional officer, basically the physician who's head of all residency programs for the whole institution. 
and the chief medical officer, and I probably left out one or two. And when we sit around every two weeks, we talk about the issues. So I believe that between that forum and in addition the bi-monthly rounds that I do with the chief nursing officer and also with the leadership of the department and with the involvement every day of the leadership of the emergency department in the environment safety and quality huddles that we have every single work day at 8 a.m. that we have tremendous oversight of the emergency department and that if you looked at 2015 and 2020 you would see two very very different sets of uh, circumstances and so I hope that answers the uh, question adequately uh, uh, council member because I believe that uh, Mount Sinai has invested tremendously I personally feel very responsible for every patient in our emergency department and uh, worry every day that we're providing the best care that we can Thank you. And in terms of your leadership, what are the demographics? We were, you know, in the article, in the investigation, there were comments as to, speaking of reward and some of your best, uh, making sure that you, that there was diversity and equity in terms of pathways to advancement, promotions, and leadership opportunities. Well, we have worked very hard as an institution to address that. I have, um, uh, some statistics that I could read, if you'll give me one second to uh, look that up. But the, I think that the main issue is that um, we have worked very hard as an institution to, uh, you know, to try to uh, improve diversity. One second. I had some nice little comments all ready to go. Just give me one second. Uh, and uh, what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll take it uh, uh, as uh, just without, without the uh, multiple pages in front of me. We have received awards uh, related to our approach to uh, gender diversity and diversity in general as an employer. We work very hard to make certain that we will not, as an academic institution, host a meeting which has all men on the panels. We work as an institution uh, to improve gender diversity such that we've actually named a dean for gender diversity at Mount Sinai. And uh, we look very carefully in all of our recruitments to see that whenever we have a senior recruitment that women and uh, people underrepresented in medicine are interviewed for every position of leadership in the institution. So with my apologies for not having all my notes right in front of me, I think I hit the, bullet, the major points. Sure, and if you do find the numbers in there, yeah. and I understand the paper yeah. situation, uh, please do let us know. Um, of course, we're very interested in knowing how that, how that culture has changed to be more welcoming t to women and others. And, you know, there is a lot of uh, stigma and, and a lot of uh, talk on, on culture, and I want to ask on the terms, in, in terms of accepting patients who are coming into your facilities, and that, that not just Mount Sinai, but all of these facilities, public versus private insurance and patient flow. How do you respond to reports of private pay patients getting qu care quicker compared to publicly insured patients? Uh, I, for Mount Sinai Hospital, that is a categorically false statement. We look very carefully at the statistics, we look, for example, at the patients who were transferred from Mount Sinai Hospital's emergency room to other hospitals, and we saw that the uh, ethnicity and the gender uh, distribution was identical to the patients that were admitted to Mount Sinai Hospital. We uh, look very carefully to see that uh, essentially uh, every patient receives the same care. When we receive any calls to expedite a patient's care, it doesn't matter where that call comes from, from a concerned family member, from a faculty person, uh, from uh, even elected officials, that no matter what the circumstances, we always try to expedite the care for every patient regardless of their socioeconomic status, their insurance status, or their ability to pay. Mount Sinai is a mission-driven organization that's committed and cares passionately about our community. Thank you, and, and Ms. Ryan, I want to ask you the same question, whether individuals with public health insurance wait longer to be admitted than those with private health insurance. 
Um, I can say without reservation that that is not true and that all of our patients, as Dr. Rich just mentioned and as you heard earlier from those from h, &H all patients are treated equally. They're treated on the basis of the acuity of their condition, not on their status as you know, an insured or an employed or unemployed. Um, it's all about how sick they are and what services do they need and how fast can we treat them and expeditiously move them through the system. Patient flow is, is equally arduous for any type of patient that walks through the emergency department. And do you have the, the data to, to back up these claims? Because we do hear from staff inside the hospital and even consumers and patients that they feel very differently uh, and they feel actually the, the opposite of, of what you're claiming now, that they do wait longer and they are treated differently. I don't have that with me, but I am happy to provide that to you because um, categorically, whether or not it's insurance status, it is not a barrier to getting the appropriate care. And, you know, because that has a lot to do with, with bias. So I guess I want to ask also what trainings around health equity and medical bias do ED physicians, nurses, and other staff receive? Did you want me to answer first? E um, both of you. I, I was going to comment earlier as doc when Dr. Rich finished about um, the diversity um, uh, situation at Mount Sinai, they have one of the most impressive diversity officers that um, I've ever encountered in your human resources department. And we've looked to this individual to help us design implicit bias training programs uh, throughout the Greater New York membership and maybe even further throughout the state because Governor Cuomo has um, dedicated a certain amount of resources as part of his maternal mortality and disparities um, in treatment initiative to ensure that staff throughout the state are trained on implicit bias. That has not begun, to the best of my knowledge, but it is certainly on individuals' hospitals' radar, and many are moving forward on their own. If I could add uh, that Mount Sinai has, for several years now, uh, uh, performed unconscious bias training for its leaders and various departments. I do not know specifically about the emergency department, but as an institution, we are committed to unconscious bias training and basically to uh, move in a direction where everyone understands that we're all on a journey and that journey means that we have to learn and teach ourselves exactly how we make mistakes. And unconscious bias is a factor in our society. It involves, uh, you know, uh, 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 put it this way, to, to improve it requires constant vigilance on our part. Thank you. I, I, I agree about the unconscious bias, and if it's for all staff, then I imagine it would be for the emergency department staff as well. Well, who, I, I'm just in saying charge that, of, yeah. I guess, at your facility at Mount Sinai, who leads the bias training? What, what dean? Uh, we have a dean for uh, diversity. Uh, that is Dr. Gary Butts, and the, uh, he leads uh, the Center for Multicultural Affairs on the school side and the Office for Diversity and Inclusion on the health system side and orchestrates with the rest of the leadership an executive diversity leadership board that meets on a regular basis several times per year and uh, coordinates with the departments for unconscious bias and other trainings uh, uh, in areas where um, you know it, it's specifically we feel it's it's more needed because you know with such a large organization we have to prioritize Absolutely. I just want to mention we, we were joined by Councilmember Moya and we are joined by Councilmember Levine. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to, to clear up, realizing there is this training that is going on because of the bias, whether conscious or unconscious, um, are there different facilities, floors, rooms based on one's method of payment? Uh, Mount Sinai does have some private rooms which require a supplement, but we um, often put patients who cannot afford that supplement in those rooms, whether it's for um, uh, infection prevention purposes, they might need an isolation room uh, because they have an infection or we want to prevent an infection such as a cancer patient who's in protective isolation. There is one private floor, uh, but once again, if those rooms are empty, we're not going to keep uh, people uh, waiting uh, elsewhere in the hospital, so we often, uh, you know, put patients in those rooms depending upon need. Are the ratios the same on like a pri on the private floor versus the another floor? Are the are the are the ratios the same? Is the care the same? Yes, and in fact, there's only there's only one there's only one private floor. It's a relatively small unit of 
of 19 beds. Uh, the rest of the hospital has a combination of semi-private and private beds, and their ratios are identical. The care is identical. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, in an ideal world, I could build all new buildings with all private rooms, but I, I live in a uh, complex health system with tr dramatically high um, capital needs, so that's not something I can, I can accomplish in the near future. Thank you. So, and I just want to go back to the burnout question and making sure that the providers know what is available. Um, you mentioned a couple of programs. Is there, is there ongoing, are there ongoing check-ins? Are you continuing your outreach, whether they're residents or long-term staff or they're nurses or, or whatever it is? How are you making sure that you are relaying that information to your, to your staff, to the faculty there to, to avoid burnout? In, in such a large organization, many departments have different processes, but I would highlight that the emergency department has been a leader in staff engagement. They have regular town halls. They have regular uh, conferences. Uh, there are staff huddles uh, every single day. And uh, I mentioned already that we have the, um, uh, the STAR unit, which is a, a full environment simulation facility. And uh, when I make my rounds, uh, uh, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, twice a month, uh, there is unhealthy food in the way of pizza or donuts or whatever is appropriate. Uh, so that after the rounds, people can feel a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a little comfort food to, uh, to help them through the day. But I think the uh, other things I would talk about are the Cheat Cart program, which is actually designed by our, social, uh, our Department of Spiritual Care. They go around with a cart. It has teas and candles and soft music, and we bring this into the lounges and we serve people uh, tea. Apparently, you have to wear a saffron scarf to make it work, as I've been told. Uh, but um, uh, I, even without the saffron scarf, I was able to do that at Mount Sinai, Queens. And we also have the eye care program, which is a staff support program where if there is, for example, um, I would say a, a patient um, uh, uh, expires in the emergency department and the staff are upset, we can call confidentially and other staff members who are in a similar sort of job class can, uh, can work together and to talk to that individual. And of course, if necessary, we refer those individuals to our employee assistance program where formal counseling is provided. Okay, must be some tea. It's very good. Can I just add a couple of uh, <laughs> comments to what was just said, to the answer to that question? Sure. I don't think you can underscore the effectiveness of what's been mentioned a couple of times today, which are huddles or safety huddles as they were form initially. Uh, titled. These are daily and sometimes twice daily um, huddles where the staff on the unit it includes all levels of staff, physicians, nurses, transporters, um, environmental services workers who can identify what they're worried about the most for their shift. What's going to go on that could possibly be go awry that would impact them or impact a patient. They're very transparent and open discussions. Executive leadership are often part of these huddles, and if they're not, they, they do sort of make their secret shopper visits so that they understand exactly what their workforce is concerned about. And they often voice concerns about their own welfare. And it might be about a patient, um, the capacity to take care of a, a type of patient that they may not be most familiar with, a diagnosis, a complicated cancer treatment that they haven't dealt with before. Staff are encouraged to speak up at all levels. All people are equal in these huddles. And I can't say enough about how it really has given the staff a sense that they are cared about, that they do trust their administrators, they do trust the executives that are leading these institutions, and they're very impressive. If you, if you attend one, you want to attend more, because every hospital does them slightly differently. I recently attended one at a Mount Sinai affiliate where the CMO has a whiteboard, and he practically, he, he basically knew about every uh, patient that they had, that anyone in that room had a concern about in that institution, whether it was getting out of urinary catheter, getting someone off a ventilator, concerns about discharge to home because the home environment wasn't safe. I was floored with the level of detail that these people knew about the patients in their hospital. So I think that goes a long way to ensuring safety. And very quickly on the eye care, um, a program that Dr. Rich mentioned, H&H &H also has the Helping the Healers Heal program. These are programs that focus only on the staff 
which are often the second victims in the healthcare environment, either because of a mor morbidity, mortality that was unexpected or something that was planned, a procedure, an unexpected complication, what have you. This is totally about ensuring that the well-being of that staff member who might have been involved with a particular patient um, care issue um, is taken care of. And more and more of our hospitals are emulating these programs. And again, it's another way to not only demonstrate support, but to really provide that needed emotional support. Thank you. And my last question, and, and thank you very much for saying and answering everything I've asked you thus far, is uh, Dr. Uh, Councilmember Eugene was here earlier and he asked health and hospitals about what they were doing to prepare for the coronavirus for a, potential, um, a potentially significant impact on the capacity of the emergency departments. How are your facilities preparing? Uh, I'll note that at Mount Sinai Hospital, we constructed a, um, uh, a, uh, a room just off the triage desk uh, where people walk in uh, to the ambulatory entrance to the emergency department, where patients who uh, uh, are, everyone has a travel screen. And every patient is asked those particular questions. And if anyone screens positive on the travel screen, fever, cough, foreign travel, for example, uh, they're immediately handed a mask and they're walked into that room and the door is closed so that they can have further evaluation. This type of system came about during the Ebola crisis in 2014 and although I am an anesthesiologist, not an infection prevention specialist, I am very impressed uh, just uh, uh, in general how the state now, Greater New York Hospital Association coordinating among the hospitals and the individual health systems have all thought carefully about what their processes will be uh, for caring for patients. That being said, uh, so many people are dying of the flu in our community. And uh, it is a preventable illness in many cases because uh, many individuals do not get their flu shots. And so I think it's important that even as we talk about COVID-19 or coronavirus preparations that we emphasize that as leaders in the city that I would hope that also we can get strong advocacy from the city council uh, to help overcome the fear of vaccination, which is rampant in our society. And many, uh, I, I, we can't predict the future, but many uh, uh, tens of thousands of patients die in the United States from flu every season. And although COVID-19 or novel coronavirus is a severe threat to the world, um, we have, um, frankly, a more curable disease at home that we fail to treat adequately. So, and thank you for saying that, because I agree, I think many forget the, the flu season and how it has, it's killed so many Americans already, and that we have a potentially severe season among us right now. So I guess in short that your health system does feel ready, you're ready, willing, and able to assist with any um, potential cases, um, really making sure that they support the health and hospital system, which has been really incredible on this, and that your emergency department is, is ready capacity-wise. Our emergency department, in fact, the entire health system has uh, contingency plans in place in terms of how to uh, treat and to safely care for patients with any disease, including uh, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. And uh, we um, are emphasizing uh, you know, fit testing for all of our staff, emphasizing to our staff, please don't steal masks, uh, that we need them for, for the hospital environment. So I think that managing the public's perception uh, and our staff's perception and making everyone feel safe is our job as, as hospital leaders, and I know we all take that job very seriously. And we will certainly try to assist with managing this kind of public perception and, and what people are reading and how New York City is actually very ready. And thank you for answering all of my questions about the public perception on some of your institutions and facilities, and I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you, Council Member. And with that, I'm going to call the next panel, Wendy Dean, Teresa Davis, and Jonathan uh, Varsler S. 
Can you say that again? All right, I'm going to ask you to say it into the microphone. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're from New Alternative, right? Yep, right. Okay. That's it, right? Okay, who would like to begin? I, I do encourage a, everyone who is here to testify to please stay and listen to our advocates and additional individuals here to testify. And I want to thank you all for your patience and waiting as we heard from some of our uh, health institutions. Sure, go ahead. Okay. So thank you. I'm Wendy Dean. I'm a physician and I am the president and CEO of the Moral Injury of Healthcare. Um, I'd like to thank you, Chairperson Rivera, and the council members um, for the opportunity to testify on the safety of New York City emergency rooms. And also, I would like to thank you for taking an interest in the challenges facing ED clinicians. The Moral Injury of Healthcare is a 501c3 nonprofit that's dedicated to addressing clinician distress through research, advocacy, education, and training. Chairperson Rivera, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, moral injury is increasingly recognized as a problem in healthcare. Since publishing an article reframing clinician distress um, to moral injury in July of 2018, we've heard from hundreds of clinicians that it is increasingly difficult to deliver good care where they work. Many of them are, are, have been emergency room clinicians. As you accurately described, Moral injury is perpetrating, bearing witness to, um, or bearing witness to acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs. In healthcare, those deeply held moral beliefs are the oaths that we take to put our patients as a priority. That is deeply ingrained in clinicians from the day they first start training. Patients come before we eat or sleep, before our children's birthdays and our own anniversary dinners. Clinicians are incredibly dedicated as as previously mentioned in several testimonies, but dedication alone is often not enough. The main theme we've heard from clinicians around the country is that staff are doing too much with too little for too long, and they worry they no longer provide the quality of care they expect as a standard. The situation is not unique to New York, to New York City, but that does not excuse inaction. Increasingly, the business framework of healthcare volume expectations, reduction in staff, tracking door-to-doctor times, decision-to-discharge times, prior authorization requirements, and leakage constraints requires that clinicians consider and often choose something other than our patients as a priority. Routine, routinely doing this increases our risk for moral injury. When the emergency room is routinely short-staffed, clinicians have less time with each patient. They rush histories and physicals, and writing orders and providing treatments. They may rely more on lab tests or imaging, which are easy to order and generate laudable revenue, but which may also inflate the patient's bill and provide an incomplete picture of the condition. Rushing makes errors more likely, alienates patients, and breaks down the unspoken alliance between clinician and patient. It makes civility a little less likely. When the emergency room is overcrowded with borders, Clinicians are distracted by the increased workload. They're frustrated that patients lack the privacy and dignity they deserve. Clinicians are afraid that in, their, that in these conditions, they will hurt patients, and that hurts them. All of this impacts patient safety with respect to medical errors, but it also impacts clinician safety because patients and families less, feel less inclined to be civil when someone who, with someone who is rushing them and dismissing their concerns. They may feel the need to be more strident to be heard, and over the long term, moral injury, being, un un being unable to get patients the care they need, when unacknowledged and unattended, may lead to burnout and contribute to unacceptably high rates of physician suicide, which is twice that of the general public. We believe the business framework of care was not put in place with nefarious intent, but that the divergence of business practices and clinical practices is at the root of the problem. Administrators and clinicians are less attuned to the challenges and incentives of the other. But nefarious intent or not, the dysfunctional framework is kept in place by a culture that is, deeply, that is not deeply curious about 
the conditions impacting the well-being of its employees. Unmasking misaligned incentives is critical. The challenge then is to realign incentives for all stakeholders to ensure patients get the best care and clinicians can work in a sustainable way. Thank you for your leadership in addressing this concern and again for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Good one. My name is Teresa Davis. I am an advocate, a community health educator, and I'm also an adult living with an inherited disorder. So I have been on both sides um, as an allied health professional working in the hospitals, particularly on HRSA-funded grants to provide non-medical coordination of care for pediatric patients with hematological disorders. Um, I can attest to what the doctor is saying about um, they're being understaffed, overworked, people on the floors. Um, I have great admiration for the medical professionals that I work with, but also as a person who is seen in the hospitals as a patient, um, I've seen some very egregious things. I myself don't always experience them because when I go in, people recognize me or they think I'm actually an employee of the hospital, so they kind of tiptoe around things. Um, but. Uh, the last time that I had to access an emergency room. Um, it was unusually crowded that evening. Um, I came in in distress, and because um, I wasn't the caricature that um, most health professionals think when they see someone with my diagnosis coming in, I was, you know, calm. It was, I was having problems breathing, um, and I was basically told, well, you know, it's busy in here tonight. I don't know when the doctor is going to see you, and we don't have any beds, so you're going to have to sit and wait. Um, my condition actually is considered something that is an emergency as on the same level as a cardiac arrest, but I was not treated in that fashion. Um, I did ha happen to see one gurney uh, behind a nurse who was telling me that well, there were no be more beds, and I told her I can't. Um, it, what I'm experiencing right now, I can't sit here and wait to be triaged, nor can I sit here and wait to take my treatment, um, which may take two to three hours. Uh, I actually told her to take my name off the list, and I walked out. And I waited until the next morning to call my physician and my daughter to help me to another hospital which when they saw me within a short period of time, they immediately admitted me. Um, the situation that I incurred that night before was because the emergency room was understaffed and could not uh, really provide the level and the quality of care that I needed because of an assumption I was not treated as an emergency case, which um, also is another problem because the National Institute for, uh, I'm going to get this right, Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, okay, NHLBLI, has a protocol of care that in some instances of I've had emergency room staff ask, is this evidence-based? And I'm like, are you serious? You're asking if an NIH protocol is evidence-based? Um, if those things were in place, and as Dr. Rich said earlier, if people were given the option and given more access to programs that were outside of the ER, you would not have this overcrowding and people rushing to go to the ER to be seen. Many of the times, um, for the people that I represent, most of who are living with inherited blood disorders, uh, do not go to the hospital as soon as they know that they need medical attention because they don't want to deal with what's happening in the emergency room. We don't want to be made to wait. We don't want to have uh, attitudes because, yes, I have seen people's faces change the moment you say what your diagnosis is. Um, it's a shame that the bias is inherent. It is present. Um, Usually, if the staff knows you, you don't get that. But if they don't know you and you come in and say, I have von Wildebrands, I have hemophilia, I have sickle cell disease, you do see a powerful change in a person's attitude towards you. Um, from the community-based 
side. We've been working diligently to try to change that. When somebody comes in and say, I need help, that they are taken seriously. We actually have two physicians, both who are living with the same condition that I have, who visit um, ED directors in hospitals throughout the city to try to speak with them um, and get them to understand that there is a protocol, that the hospital should be looking at this as part of their policy and adopt it so that when people come in to be cared, that things are taken care of rel relatively quickly. Um, for the last nine years, the coalition of, what is it, New York State Coalition of Inherited Blood Disorders have been lobbying for monies for comprehensive treatment protocols centers throughout the state. And as of this year, again, we have been denied uh, the opportunity to be funded to get those programs, which would alleviate a lot of people going into the emergency room um, to receive their care. And uh, one of the things, as an advocate, as an individual with a rare disease, um, what we need help from the city council with is having these protocols of cares established in both public and private hospitals. That when we walk in, staff immediately knows this is what needs to be done, especially when we're telling people, as soon as you know you're gonna need that help, go right away to the doctor. Because not everyone has a private physician, not every private physician has to set up to, to actually provide treatment in their offices um, for their patients, particularly when it comes to having to dispense narcotics. Um, you know, they have to have certain setups to have those things there. So the first thing your doctor will tell you is go to the emergency room. And um, when you incur a situation where the emergency room is particularly overcrowded, um, there have been instances where people have been in the emergency room after being brought in for six hours and no one came to see them in that cubicle. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult because I do sympathize with the professionals and what they're going through. I have seen people be verbally abused. I have not, I've heard the stories, I've not actually seen staff be physically assaulted, but I know that these kind of things do happen. And then I've also been, you know, witness to on the receiving end of just malicious attitudes would kind of escalate the kind of, um, negative interactions between a professional and, and a patient um, that should never happen. Um, but I can say, you know, my last hospital mission was absolutely wonderful. We had, you know, a few <laughs> um, issues that I'm working with the administration for them to fix. Um, but for the most part, I think that um, we may have to legislate certain things to make sure that not only are people giving, given more information to access alternative means for treatment, like um, what Dr. Rich said earlier about receiving treatment at home at the level of the hospital. That's the first time that I'm hearing that. And I've been advocating and, and, and going to DC, going to Albany, speaking with physicians. I have never been told you know, that hospitals can offer treatment at home at the same level that you would get it in the hospital because there are a lot of people who would opt to do that as opposed to going into an emergency room and creating you know, further crowding, um, taking up space, uh, and also increasing costs for care. And that's something else that we're also trying, as from the community base, trying to alleviate the uh, tremendous costs to Medicare and Medicaid for emergency room treatment. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. I just want to make sure that we hear from Jonathan. Jonathan's going to be very gracious and tell me how to pronounce his last name. Uh, Van der Elst. So uh, I'm a hello counselor. I'm a Belgium intern. Um, it's my third week in New York. I'm an intern from New Alternatives. So excuse my uh, English because it, when sometimes it's not that good, uh, but I'm trying. Yeah. Um, so No Alternatives is a client for homeless LGBT youth and uh, in my first week of, uh, of my internship I met a client at the ER, he was calling us because he had like a lot of pain and he was crying 
So I went over there and it, um, he was already in the ER for six days. They transferred him from ER to ER. There were no rooms uh, upstairs. And uh, when he called for a doctor, they didn't, uh, they didn't came. Um, it was a mess there actually. It was so crowded. I was shock shocked because I never saw actually in hospital like, like this before. Uh, there were no no beds. Uh, people were shouting. There was everybody was scared. My client was scared because there were like uh, people who had drugs problems walking in. People who, yeah, it was just chaotic. Um, so that's why he called. He he didn't feel safe. Uh, I didn't feel safe. I I me myself. I get sick after three days. I think bef uh, because of I don't know. It, nobody wear masks. It, it yeah. I can explain. I never saw something like this before, actually. Um, but then he got a room. Uh, no, uh, so they wanted to discharge him, and I asked to and I asked to a nurse like, look at him. He is crying when he has to pee because he got infections and psenomia. Uh, he's crying when he had to pee. He he has a lot of pain, and they wanted to discharge him. And I, I think I stayed there for two, three hours. Uh, keep asking the doctors like, you can discharge him. And then suddenly they came to me like, oh maybe. You, we shouldn't discharge him. So I was thinking, like, what if I wasn't there? Are they? Uh, wouldn't they have uh, him discharged while he was still while, while he was still sick? So then he came. Uh, then he also ha had uh, HIV meds, uh, HIV meds, uh, but they took it away from him because I, I didn't know there's like a rule that you can take outside medications to uh, to the hospitals. So he didn't take his meds for seven days, and then he, when he finally got his room, because my uh, Kate Barnhart, my supervisor, called uh, uh, the, the council. Uh, she called something to get the room uh, fixed, and then when he finally get the room, he still didn't get his HIV meds. I finally thought like, oh, now the care is going to get better, but it didn't get better because they're at like a, a bottom to call the the doctors, and uh, he called the doctor for like four times. But still, no doctor came. Like, I I visit him for four days in the when he get a, a, an upper bed, a, a bed at the at the upper floor. I visit him for four days. Uh, I think I spent it 15 hours with him, calling for doctors, uh, calling for nurses, and yeah, they just didn't came. I didn't. I can't understand it. Like how they just can come when you call a doctor. And then finally, uh, and then he was like freaking out because he didn't get the care that he wanted. And then suddenly, of course, like uh, the other person told the securities came. So that's maybe why they have to hire more because the people can't uh, hold it anymore. Um, at the securities came, to, uh, he was following him, trying to calm him down. But I was like, just get a doctor here. And then finally a doctor came and he didn't still uh, get his meds because he was uh, saying like he need to get tested again because it's a long time he took his HIV meds. So he need to uh, be tested again before we can give it, uh, him. And I was like, okay, then test him. And I was like, oh, you can't because you know, uh, insurance and stuff like that and all the things that I don't understand. Um, so then when he felt better, uh, when the psenomia was over, he get discharged, but still didn't have the follow up for his HIV meds. And then uh, we made an appointment with the doctor uh, and the doctor said that he couldn't see him because the Medicaid insurance didn't cover, uh, cover his plan. So I think there are like a lot of problems here about the healthcare system. It's, it's yeah. And I, I feel like the doctors were saying some, or the CEOs, I don't know what they were, but they were saying some nice words, and I feel it's a lie. It's like just some business talk for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we are having this hearing because of uh, the function of our healthcare system currently and how it underserves so many. So I have a, just a couple questions, and, and I guess they're for all of you or one of you, depending on kind of your experience and your research, and I guess your title as a medical professional, as an advocate. Do you think, do you have an ideal staffing ratio for the emergency par department, based on what you've heard and what you've seen? Oh, sorry to, to say something. Uh, I went to a nurse, and she told me she had 50 patients. So. 
I heard it that she had 50 patients for one uh, uh, nurse. So the numbers are the numbers are true. Do you want to share which hospital you were at? Since uh, since uh, Maune, wait, I write it, write it down. <laughs> Mount Sinai. I'm sorry. Mount, C yeah. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Too bad he's not here. Um, <laughs> The, the the staff to patient ratio is and let me very, let me just low. let it's, me add something for you because yeah. you mentioned something about bias and how people are seen and treated mm -hmm. once they enter the system and what more do you think hospitals could do to address the kind of health equity concerns that that you've brought up um, there is some kind of a disconnect um, between understanding the physiological manifestation of these disorders, what it's actually doing in the body, and what people think the disease is. Um, actually, Novartis made a very good simulation that shows what's happened. They show just components going down the vein, in the plasma and then what happens, for instance, with sickle cell disease when the cell starts to sickle and how it rubs up against the endothelial lining of the vein and damages it and then not only the red but the white blood cells and everything else starts to clump together, inflammation ensues and that inflammation is the pain. So when we come in saying that I'm in pain, the first thought is drug seeker. You know, you're coming for drugs. This disease is predicated. It is everything about this disease starts with the pain. But the pain is basically a signal saying there is something wrong, something seriously wrong. I've, I've had people, I've seen people discharged who should have been admitted. Um, I've been in emergencies while I was doing rounds, you know, as a care coordinator, um, who come back after being sent home and died in the ER because they didn't get the care that they needed when they came in the first time. You don't send somebody with a respiratory complaint who has a weakened immune system home with a prescription for antibiotics when you should have admitted them and started uh, intravenous antibiotics, you know, specifically after taking a gram stain and seeing what are they gonna respond best to. Um, even if they started with a broad spectrum at some point, if it was an, a, an infection that could be identified and something more specific could help, then do that. But that's not what's happening. People are being sent home. Um, people are coming in with a complication called acute chest, which is, uh, can be terminal, if not uh, diagnosed and treated properly. And people have been sent home in acute chest, and when they come back, have to be rushed to ICU for treatment, which includes a partial blood exchange. Things don't have to progress to that point. If you're following a protocol and knowing this person comes in and they're explaining what their particular complaints is, you can do the testing to substantiate or rule out stuff, but get the person into the care that they need. And that's not happening across the board. Um, also, it, it, it doesn't help when Patients aren't very well educated, don't really understand, and can't really relate to the physician certain complaints for them to kind of figure out, okay, maybe we need to look at this, we need to look at that. People do get caught up in the fact that they are in pain and may not understand that that pain may be coming from a complication that's serious and possibly even life-threatening. So you're, you say, I, I guess I'm summarizing in that, there's the patient education piece, there's the education and, and training component that the doctors so desperately need. Mm -hmm. There's a clear cultural competency that's not translating, and more so that people want to see themselves reflected in their caregivers, which is something that I, tr I try to ask the institutions in terms of demographics and how we're promoting through leadership. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to ask also you, Dr. Dean, you had a couple of recommendations as well that were very similar. Uh, you mentioned adequate staffing, sufficient inpatient beds to minimize boarding, and then physicians and nurses who just have sufficient time and focus. Correct. So I, I think one of the challenges that 
that clinicians face across healthcare, but especially in the emergency department, is that they feel under pressure from multiple perspectives. And so they feel under pressure to um, make sure the patients are safe, that their throughput is right, that they're generating enough revenue. Um, and the reality is, if they were, this is my bias, but if they were shown more compassion and better supported by their institution, they would be better able to support their patients and show compassion for them. What that looks like is a variety of things. It may mean um, listening to them regarding what they need for staffing. It may be uh, troubleshooting where the real pain points are in care that might be unexpected. And what that, what that looks like is administrators and clinicians coming together to really ferret out where are the roadblocks in healthcare and working together to fix them. Well, I just, I just want to thank you. I, and I want to just tell you, Jonathan, I'm just going to call you Jonathan. Thank you for sharing, I guess, what you witnessed. That was the experience of someone else, which sounds completely unacceptable and horrible. And I'm, I'm sorry that that was kind of your, I don't want to say you're welcome into our healthcare system, because certainly you've been doing work, was, is what it sounds like. But um, we're certainly hopeful that we can make improvements together along with advocates and medical professionals. So I, I just want to thank you all for your testimony. I want to thank you all for being here, for all that you do, for everyone that you serve, and your commitment to improving health outcomes for every single person, regardless of their status, their background, how much money they have, what they look like, who they love. And um, just thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chairwoman. And with that, I will adjourn this hearing. Thank you so much to everyone who was here.